Hi, I'm Larry Reed, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart, and today we're going to talk about homeschooling. Homeschooling is one of those things where many people have opinions on it. Some people are very misinformed. Some people are completely uninformed. Many libertarians choose to homeschool because they don't want their children to be indoctrinated by the state. Some families do it for faith reasons. There's a whole bunch of reasons that people would choose to homeschool, and there's a lot of reasons that people would choose not to homeschool their children. But I can't really talk about this by myself, so I actually have a special guest with us, Allison Morrow. Allison Morrow is an entrepreneur, homeschool parent, and co-founder of GoodSchooling.net, a website dedicated to breaking down the barriers for parents so they can achieve the educational goals for their children. Allison, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. So yeah, I'm really glad to have you on because it sounds like you're you're an expert for homeschooling and we got connected and I'm really excited to have us talk about some of the things that you have worked on and, and, and are doing. So tell us a little bit about your personal story. How did you get into homeschooling your children? Were you always planning on doing that? Is this just something that kind of was like, eh, I didn't want to, but then I did. Tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. So personally, I was raised through public school, kindergarten, all the way through college, and I actually went into education. So my background is actually, uh, I have a degree in elementary education. I taught elementary school, fifth grade for three years, and I taught middle school English for two. But I, even as a kid, I wanted to be homeschooled, which was so interesting because this was back in the 80s when not a lot of people were homeschooling. And my my family were fairly young Christians at the time, so we weren't real immersed in the Christian culture yet where a lot of the homeschooling was going on. So I don't even know where I came up with this concept of homeschooling in the first place. But I used to beg my parents and beg my parents, and my mom was like, no way, girl. I hardly pass school. <laughs> She's like, I am. there's no way I could do that. And uh, so I stayed in public schools and went into education. And um, I actually, I remember the day that I decided I wanted to homeschool my own kids. Your senior year, when you're doing an elementary uh, education, or I guess any education degree, you do your two week takeover where you've been shadowing a mentor teacher, you know, for your, your student teaching. And then the classroom becomes yours for two weeks. And it's kind of like your trial run as a teacher. And the very first day, I remember standing at the front of the room, looking out at the students and thinking, I love doing this. I love teaching. I love inspiring and the theater of teaching. I love all this, but I never want my own kids in those seats. And it was just those first few months of being in the system. I could already see how imperfect it was, how broken it was in so many ways. And that really stayed with me. And when my husband and I got married, you know, it's funny, we didn't actually talk about how we wanted to raise our kids in terms of their education until our first daughter was born. And then I kind of popped this idea on him and said, hey, what do you think about this? And thankfully, he was very much on the same page. And so we you know, had this idea that when she was a little older, we were going to formally start homeschooling. And so when she was about six, we you know, started getting all the research done and choosing the curriculum and everything. And then um, God kind of threw us into a tizzy of sorts. Things got very, very different for our family very quickly. And I had to go back to work. And my husband uh, ended up being the one staying home and doing the homeschooling for the first two years. And I went back and and started teaching again in in middle school. That's when I had that job. So our first two years were actually all him. It was all on him. And it was funny because I, of course, we thought I would be the one doing the homeschooling. So I had done all the research and chosen the curriculum and had the schedule. And I kind of had to just dump it all in his lap. And he was like, gosh, I wish I'd paid more attention when we had these conversations. (laughs) (laughs) It's coming. And, uh, but it turns out he is a phenomenal teacher. And he, those first two years were fantastic. He did such an incredible job. And that was how we got started. And we have been homeschooling ever since. And our daughters now are 13. She's in seventh grade. And then we have an 11 year old in fifth. I can imagine that would be a little interesting. People say, so you homeschool and you're the one with the degree and he's the one doing the work at home. (laughs) Yeah, it was it was weird. And, you know, I felt bad for him because so, you know, the vast majority of homeschooling parents out there are the mom. It's usually the mom that's doing it. So it was kind of hard for him to break into 
the homeschool groups and things like that. Cause it's all these moms hanging out and he's like, I feel a little weird sitting around talking with the moms. So it was, it was kind of awkward <laughs> in some ways, but we were really blessed at the time to be in an area where we had a lot of homeschooling connections through our church. And so that was, that was a great opportunity for, for him to be able to help the girls make some connections with other homeschool kids and get together with people that we already knew fairly well. Was it difficult to make the choice to homeschool? Or like, were your kids, was your daughter in favor of it, you know, right away? Or did she have these like, oh, no, but I want to go to school with my friends or something? Well, at the time, we were living in Colorado at the time, and our family was the only family on the block with kids. So all of the friends that my girls had, in a way, were very intentionally chosen by my husband and I. The the people that we got together with, the families that we got together with from church, the vast majority of them homeschooled. And we did that because we wanted to have a homeschooling community you know, that we could get involved with, that that we could get to know and our kids could get to know. And so that was really the only reality that they knew. They they didn't have any real understanding of what public school was. The school bus for the local school stopped in front of our house. And so we would get questions about that. Why are those kids getting on the bus? And uh, they wanted to ride the bus. That was like the one thing that they thought was really cool. <laughs> so the one reason that they wanted to go to go to quote unquote real school. But um, it, it wasn't actually until we moved here to Texas where um, ironically, there's a way bigger homeschooling community. But in our neighborhood, there were about 20 kids that all go to the local school. And that was when we started getting, uh, you know, the questions from our girls about why can't we go to the school down the street like everybody else? And so we had to be a lot more intentional, work a lot harder here to make really good roots in the homeschooling community so that our girls had those good friendships and didn't feel like they were missing out. Have they gotten to ride a bus? (laughs) They have. Well, okay, uh, good. Like, it's one of them. Yeah, they used a school bus to get up to the uh, the preteen camp for uh, church a, a year or two ago. So Abby was very excited. That she <laughs> got to bus. I think that was a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been. I, uh, I had to go on a. I I don't like school buses as an adult because uh, I went on a field trip with my daughter and my son, and we had to. It was even on the highway, and it was just so uncomfortable. I yeah. guess for little kids, it's a it's a very different experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. You have written, so you have a website, goodschooling.net. So you've had several years of experience in homeschooling at your story. How did, how did this website and I guess business get started? You know, over the last few years, a lot of my friends that knew that I used to teach, but that I was homeschooling my own kids started sending me emails, sending me messages on Facebook saying, okay, what do you know that I don't know? Like you never put your kids in the school where you were teaching. You've always homeschooled, but you're a teacher. Like, how does this work out? Why are you doing this? What's, what's your motivation? And then the more conversations I'd have with these people, the more they'd they'd start admitting, you know, we're really unhappy with our kids' school, but we really don't understand how the home, how the whole homeschooling thing works. And I, I realized through these conversations that people were really intimidated because homeschooling is still very countercultural. I mean, even despite the fact that it's grown as much as it has and it has become far more mainstream than it ever was, it's still not, you know, fully mainstream. It's still quite the, you know, alternative selection, particularly in a lot of specific areas in the country. And so there was a lot of feeling intimidated, feeling confused, overwhelmed from these friends of mine who we're really starting to get excited about the idea of homeschooling, but just had no idea how to get started, how to do it. They were still convinced that this wasn't something that they really could do. You know, they'd say, well, I I don't have a teaching degree like you do. So how can I do this? And questions like that. So that was kind of where the idea was born because I realized I was spending sometimes hours every week, just almost like counseling and shepherding and mentoring my friends on how to make this change. And my sister-in-law one day was like, you know, have you ever thought of turning this into a business? Because you're spending an awful lot of time doing it anyway. And it was like the light bulb went off. And I thought, I, I've never seen anyone who does something like this. It, obviously, there's a niche. Obviously, there's a need for this. So that's where Good Schooling was born. And we, uh, my husband and I started kind of brainstorming ideas about what that might look like and what kind of resources did families want. And we looked back on our own start, you know, those first two years even though I have an education background. And so I understand when I'm looking at curriculum, I understand what I'm looking at. It's not overwhelming to me. And when I think about, you know, lesson plans and scope and sequence and all these various things, that's all in my, my language. I get that. But even so we had an incredibly difficult first two years, as fantastic as my husband was, his teaching was tremendous, but we realized that even with all the research I'd done, researching curriculum, all the stuff we bought, 
we ended up switching everything out that we had started with. And we kept thinking, this just seems like such a big hit or miss kind of thing. Like you just kind of cross your fingers when you get this curriculum and hope that it works as well for you as it did for, you know, the mom in the, the homeschooling group that you're in who recommended it. And I thought there has to be some better way to systematically make this switch. There has to be some way to make sure you've thought through everything that you need to think through, that you have really analyzed what you want and what your child needs before you start choosing curriculum so that when you do get that curriculum, you don't you know, bring it home, open it, use it for a week and go, wow, that was not the right thing. And so we started kind of trying to come up with these systems and, and just make it so that it would be a much more structured approach to making the switch. And it was less of a leap of faith and kind of a blind jump into this world where you just kind of hope you swim and not sink and trying to create a program that would set parents up for homeschooling success, make it a much less overwhelming transition and make it a more well thought out approach. And over time, we came up with the system that I've created for determining what curriculum is going to work best for your family, a method for creating your family's own personalized methodology, and just a few other things that we kind of put together into this coaching program. And all of a sudden, we had this business, and there it was. How long has it been at business itself, as opposed to like the development and your uh, pro bono time with all your friends? <laughs> um Full on business, I started, um, gosh, I think it was 2017. 2016 was when I really started doing the, the research and, and that was the year really I started talking the most with families. That and That's kind of what catapulted us into this in the first place. But 2017 was when I first started working with clients and kind of testing my system that I'd created. And you probably spent a lot of time busting myths, which has probably led up to the, the, the free book on your website. Busting the Homeschool Myths, which is basically the top 10 myths that you've identified as very prevalent. And so, you know, our listeners can go to goodschooling.net and, and download that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do want to talk about just a couple of them or have you talk about a couple of them before we kind of jump into a couple. Have you found that one of the questions while I was reading is like, I wonder if geographic region and where people are, whether they're in churches or whether they don't, they're not religious at all impacts the kind of myths they believe about homeschooling. Mm, I am sure it does because there are definitely specific regions of the country where homeschooling is much more prevalent, where people know more homeschoolers. They've actually interacted with them. They are, you know, their neighbors or the, you know, friends down the street or people in their Bible study. And so they have more of an opportunity to see up close what homeschooling looks like. But in states where it's much more regulated, there are far fewer homeschoolers just because some states make it really difficult to jump through all the necessary hoops. So there aren't as many people for you to run into, to find. And so these myths just kind of keep growing and growing and growing. It kind of becomes this almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, homeschooling is, mm. is too difficult because X, Y, Z, um, but people think X, Y, Z is difficult because they don't know homeschoolers. And so it just kind of keeps feeding into why people don't, don't jump into it in the first place. But you know, here, for example, here in Texas, we have one of the largest homeschooling communities in the country, and it's because homeschooling is virtually unregulated here. And so because of that, it's very rare anymore, at least in our area, to find someone who has never met a homeschooler who knows nothing about it whatsoever. Most people have had some personal connection of some kind with somebody. And so it's slowly starting to break down some of those myths because they can see more up close how it actually plays out. One of the myths that you talk about is it's actually the first one you kind of go from 10 down to one that it's only for geniuses and prodigies. And, you know, I also thought, you know, it, it could also be for the kind of kid who might have special needs in any direction, however you want to kind of see that. And it's like, you know what, they need special attention in some way, whether it's because they have so much to offer and they're not going to get the attention in, in a public school or even a private school, or, you know, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, they're, they're trying to, you know, pay close attention because maybe their school doesn't have the resources uh, for those needs. But you kind of dispel that myth that this isn't just for a special case kids. This is, this can be for any child. Exactly. Because every child, you know, I'm not going to say every child is a genius because I don't want to water down the word genius, but every child 
if they're given the opportunity to really leverage their strengths, is going to get much further with those abilities and be able to develop them more if they have that opportunity. And that's not how the conventional schooling approach is built. It's not built to look at every child and say, where do you excel? Where do you struggle? How can we use your strengths to help you figure out these weaknesses and overcome them and, and help you, you know, become as fully developed in your strengths as you can be. That's just not what schooling is in, in the conventional sense. And so even children who are dead center of the bell curve, like they're, they are as average as, as they come, but even just those things that they're interested in, that they're excited about, that they are curious about, if you're able to give them that individualized time and that opportunity to really dig into those things, it can help them to develop these quote unquote average abilities into a, a higher level than they would be otherwise. And so, yes, you're right there. You know, the kids on either side of the bell curve, they definitely, you know, benefit from homeschooling because they can be given either the space that they need as maybe a child who's extremely intelligent to just you know, follow that intelligence where it takes them. And then kids on the other side who have these struggles by giving them that one-on-one -on -one time, it's going to help them to do the best that they possibly can and even push them further than they would have gotten in a conventional system. But then, yeah, even those kids in the middle who are just, you know, they're just average kids and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But it allows them to also be able to develop to the very best of their ability and to find those things that they they really do excel in and to be able to, you know, maybe be known for that instead of just being, you know, the kid who's always in the, you know, the red reading group because they're just smack dab in the middle of average, you know. You know, you use the word Excel in every single scenario there, all three of those. And so, I mean, <laughs> I think this obviously goes back to the the student teacher ratio that, you know, we talk about, you know, when we deal with just conventional schooling, it's like, well, of course, the fewer number of students that someone has, the more they can invest in, in their development. And obviously, you know, unless you're the Duggars family, um, you're not, you're, you're basically able to, in, you, in your case, able to feed into two daughters exactly, as opposed to 22 exactly. or, or even higher. I had not see, heard of a class of being up to 40, which you sort of briefly mentioned. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my goodness, that's crazy. Oh my gosh. When I lived in California, right after I got my teaching degree, I was subbing in um, one of the districts in Orange County and I substituted in a class with 42 kids and it was in a trailer. It was in like one of those, you know, like trailer type buildings. It was the worst teaching experience I'd ever had. 42 kids in one of those little metal For the buildings. entire year? Or was that just like a special situation for that week? No, that, week? Was, that was their class all year. Oh my word. Yeah. It was, you could hardly move in the room. It was unbelievable. I thought, I cannot imagine having to come to this room every single day. I would go mad. It was just crazy. Huh. That, that, that's really crazy. Yeah. Um, so... Oh, moving on from that disaster situation. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that you had a teaching degree and that, of course, people look at people might look at you and say, oh, well, of course you could do that. You know, you have a teaching degree and so you're capable. And, you know, the first I've you know, with all these myths, I, I read most of these and I'm like, OK, only one of them maybe really appealed to me as like, oh, I, I need to overcome that because I grew up. I grew up, I did actually kind of all three is what I, is what I tell people. I did private school, I did public school, and I also did some homeschooling as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so most of these myths, they didn't, they weren't like things that I'm like, oh yeah, I wonder what she has to say about that. Like I kind of knew where you were going with it, but you know, there's the one about being a teacher is probably the kind that people probably bring up a lot. It's like, well, I just, I just can't. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the kind of person that you, you address in your, on your website. It's like, we, we, you can do it mm -hmm. and, and we can help. And so that has to be a pretty prevalent one, no matter, no matter who's, I mean, even, I mean, I don't know, maybe even people who do have teaching degrees, but they, you know, it's been years since they've done any teaching and they, they already, you know, they feel inferior and unable to do it. Yeah. It, you know, what's funny is that I actually found that having a background in education was a detriment when we started homeschooling. And it was because I had been so immersed in one specific model of education and 
I had never had the opportunity to really think outside that box and look at other approaches. I knew that that approach was not ideal for everybody and that I didn't want to homeschool that way. And yet all that research I did that first year, all that stuff I dumped in my poor husband's lap, it was very conventionally based. It was very school at home like and instead of being homeschool like and it was because that's all I had known and so I tell people all the time when they say oh well yeah you have a teaching degree of course you can homeschool I say believe it or not that that was something I had to overcome it's going to be a lot easier for somebody who has not been I don't want to say brainwashed but or indoctrinated but it's essentially what it was you know indoctrinated in believing this is how you do education and so when you haven't had that you're a little more open-minded, I think, to being able to see all of the different ways that learning can happen and that an education can be delivered. And the other thing I point out to parents too is the fact that the minute you became a parent, you became a teacher. And when you think of the first four years of your child's life, they're learning everything from you. You're teaching them how to hold the spoon, how to walk, how to tie their shoes, how to get dressed, all of these things. And just because it now turns to academics doesn't mean that you no longer have the ability to instruct. I think what people assume is, oh, I don't have the knowledge to pass on. They'll mm-hmm. think, well, okay, I can teach kindergarten. Like I know the letters and the numbers and the sounds they make, and I think I can teach addition, you know. But then they say, oh, I, I can't teach math. That's the that's the big thing. Everyone freaks out about math. I can't teach math. And I I realize that I think. People assume that if you have an education degree, it means that you have in your head all of the knowledge that you're supposed to teach to somebody. And I always tell people, okay, what you need to realize is that as, for example, as an education major, um, elementary education major, I am certified to teach kindergarten through sixth grade. And then I got my certification for middle school. So now I can teach through eighth grade. That does not mean that I have essentially nine years of curriculum in my head. Like that's, that's not how it works. Every teacher gets into the classroom where they're going to teach. And the first thing they do is open the teacher's editions, you know, (laughs) and I'm like, that's, you have those too. When you buy the curriculum, you get the teacher's edition, you get, you know, the, the golden key that, you know, the students always used to be like the teacher's edition, you know, you get that. And so that's how you teach because you have the book that tells you the answers and, and shows you how to do things. You're just taking that knowledge, you're reading it and going, oh, okay, here you go, kiddo. This is how you do this. And then you're walking them through it as you're looking at the teacher's edition. So it's not that being a teacher specially, you know, equips you. It's that you have learned, really, the vast majority of the things you've learned are classroom management and theory and, you know, all of these big group approaches to education, which is nothing that you need when you're teaching your own kids. Okay, so f- since you don't have to be a teacher to do this, there obviously are supplemental things that you can do. So there's the teacher's the teacher's guide and answer key. And then, of course, we have all this technology that enables things like video curricula. I mean, kids can YouTube an answer to anything they need to know. Like, yep. uh, you know, I don't think I've ever used YouTube as a verb, but there we go. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but they can do it. I mean, when I did my – I did a year and a half of homeschooling. It was through video curriculum. And, uh-huh. I mean, we, we got a box of video VHS tapes oh, wow. uh, when – and, you know, every month or however often it was and my mom was the we joked at my house that my mom was the teacher and my dad was the principal and um which my dad you know he he endorsed everything we did but he he wasn't very involved except for yeah. when we you know had um when I had math questions he was an accountant um oh. <laughs> so so except for that you know and 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 even then you know I was learning things he never needed to know to do accounting so I had to call the the hotline that they had for the video curriculum so you know nowadays there's a whole bunch of you know options out there there's like Ron Paul homeschool curriculum there's the traditional uh the one like the ones I did um at more conservative uh university options or so, at more conservative university sources I should say um so I I just want to get at your thoughts what do you what do you do you have an evaluation on some of those opportunities that are out there? Are there things that are better than others? What have you what have you learned? That, you know, that is definitely one of the best parts of homeschooling now, as opposed to 20 years ago, and even 10 years ago, mm-hmm. are the sheer number of resources that are available to parents that make it possible for them to homeschool without having to provide all of the instruction themselves. The one thing that I've noticed, though, has been this idea of public school online, which for some families, that is a great fit. 
Um, but a lot of families, when they're first coming into homeschooling and and they have those those concerns about their ability to teach, that tends to be the first thing that they go to. Oh, K12.com or Connections Academy, because it takes care of everything for you. It's free because it's public school online and they like the idea of not having to pay a lot of money for it. But what they don't realize is that you don't get any flexibility with those programs. And that's something that I don't think parents realize they think, oh, homeschooling, like we can, you know, we can kind of do this in a way that works for our kid and we can use this online program, but they don't realize that you don't have flexibility with online public school. And so there's confusion around, you know, well, how, how helpful are these online courses if you don't have any flexibility? And so what they need to realize is that there's a wide spectrum of programs out there that are online, but you need to look very closely and make sure you understand what you're signing up for. So any of those, you know, public school options, they actually say on the website, this is not homeschooling. This is public school. And so, you know, you have to be online a certain amount of time every week. You have to turn in assignments. You don't get, as a parent, you don't get to say, uh, we're going to take this week off, or you don't have to do this assignment, or we're going to do this differently. There's also a lot of handholding, especially for younger kids on those programs. So parents kind of have this idea of being able to turn it all over. You know, their kid just gets on the computer in the morning and they do their assignments and they're done. The parent doesn't realize there's a lot of handholding that they need to do, particularly with the younger elementary kids to get through those programs. But then there are a lot, oh my gosh, so many options online of um, live classes, of recorded classes where, you know, you can just access them anytime. Um, there is still, you know, not VHS anymore, but the CD, you know, based or DVD based programs, there's still those. And there are, you know, like old school publishers that are coming out with online programs now where they're putting their materials online, like Bob Jones University. And so there are loads of options out there, but you need to, as a parent, you need to make sure that you're doing your research and you know, first of all, exactly what's going to be expected of your child. Like, you know, can they miss a class? Can they turn assignments in late? Is there someone actually grading this or is that the, the parent's job? And then know what your responsibility as a parent is going to be. What do you need to make sure is, um, you know, that, that you're doing? Are you grading things? Are you just making sure your kid gets their time on, on online? Is there nothing you have to do? You can literally just plug and play and you let your kid do it. Um, and so that's that's the thing. You know, it's, it's great that there's so many options, but parents do have to be very careful to make sure that they know exactly what they are getting into with those programs. Have you heard of the university model? Yes. Uh, what and and maybe if hopefully we're talking about the same thing. It's like a hybrid version of like a private school and or public, and then also at home. That's at least that's what we they it's called around here. Yes, my actually my daughters were both uh, involved in one of those last year. Okay, was it at a private school or was it like your local government public school? Um, it was actually a nonprofit. A friend of ours and her daughter actually started it. And so it's a Christian nonprofit. They started it from scratch. It wasn't like an umbrella program or with an existing program already. And so in a way, it's essentially um, private. But as a nonprofit, it was it was much lower price than, you know, a lot of um, private options usually are. And I think those kind of hybrid programs are a fantastic middle ground for families who aren't 100 percent sure that they're ready to make the leap into homeschooling full time because it it gives them guidance of what they're supposed to do. I mean, essentially the parent in those kind of arrangements is making sure that the homework gets done, you know, helping to answer questions or get answers from teachers or, you know, help their child learn how to communicate with their teacher when they've got questions, things like that. But they, the child is on campus two or three times a week. And so they kind of get that you know, a little bit of the the break of not being home all the time together, but then having more time together than they normally would if the child was, you know, at a regular five day program. And so I, I, I do think it's a great first step. And again, however, though, it is going to be one of those things where parents need to be aware of how much flexibility there is. So for example, with our program, my younger daughter has dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD. And so the whole classroom experience was difficult for her because sitting in a chair for long periods of time, not really her thing. And reading, very difficult. Handwriting, very difficult because of the dysgraphia. So I, however, was able to work with the teacher and just say, okay, we're going to do things like this because this is how my kid works. And because it was this kind of a program that was very kind of a partnership with parents, I was able to do that. I was able to say, you know, we're, we're going to do it this way. 
uh, and we're going to do this this way. And that was, uh, that was a fantastic option for her. But in some programs, they are much more strict. There's not as much flexibility. Um, so again, you know, parents, it really is a great model and it, it helps students also who really crave that classroom experience. My older daughter is very social. And so that's been a struggle for her the last few years with homeschooling, which is actually why we had decided to do that program last year. She did it this year as well, so that she had that experience with other kids on a regular basis. And she was in a classroom, changing classes and things like that. She really kind of craved that more conventional environment. And so it was a great middle ground to be able to let her have some of that, but then retain some control over how we were doing the learning and, and how we were getting assignments done and things like that. So parents, again, they just need to be aware of, of how is this program structured? How much flexibility do we have? You know, what, what kind of accommodations are we going to be able to request and have made? Programs like that typically don't have much in the way of resources with uh, for special needs and things like that. So that's something that parents, you know, they need to make sure it's very clear with the administration. How are we going to handle the needs that my child has um, so that they're having those met? You were talking about your daughter needing to be among friends, you know, that, that kind of leads right into the next kind of myth. And this was the biggest myth when I was a kid. This was the biggest myth that I think parents worried that their kids would not be properly socialized and mm -hmm. not socialized as in like politically socialist or something like that, but just like they wouldn't develop proper social skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that wasn't a hard myth to overcome because I experienced it. My sister homeschooled her kids. Uh, my sister's children were the ages of my younger sibling. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually in school while they were also in school. I was many years ahead of them, but I was able to kind of watch them. And I'm like, they, they turned out just fine. They were fine all the way up through. Yeah. And it was very puzzling to me is that, that that would be like one of the, first, Oh, I could, they need to be out and among people and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's not true. Right. And so this was the, <laughs> this was the myth that I'm like, oh yeah, I already know that homeschool kids are not awkward and unsocialized, but you actually have a little bit more history to answer that question. And I was very fascinated by that because I, I would say I somewhat experienced it in terms of its observation. But could you describe that? The uh, I, I've written it down as the 1980s culture war soldiers reputation, yes. uh, which is what you the phraseology you use. Yeah. So homeschooling, modern homeschooling, I should say, in the United States was really brought to the fore by conservative Christians back in the 80s. And it was when public schools, for a lot of reasons, kind of started going downhill. And conservative Christian parents were really concerned about the curriculum, the things that were being taught, about their values being kind of trampled by what was being taught in the public schools. And so they were the ones that started pulling their kids and homeschooling en masse. But for many of them, the idea was we are going to homeschool our kids so that we can prepare them to, as adults, go back into the culture and change the American culture for Christ and turn this ship around, bring our country back to being a truly Christian country. And so that, a lot of ways, that was really their driving force. It wasn't even necessarily just the education they wanted their children to have. It was this long-term goal that they had of training their children to then go fight this culture war and to infiltrate politics and athletics and entertainment and infuse those areas with Christian perspective. So unfortunately, what ended up happening is, and, and these are a lot of the sad stories that we do see from children who were or now adults, but people who were educated as homeschooled kids back because of that, uh, back in those days, is that they were very much sequestered. They didn't get out with a lot of people. If it wasn't someone from church, and they didn't really interact with them. They were very, they were in a bubble. And so it was in a lot of ways for a lot of kids, it actually was very unhealthy the way that they were raised is because there was this fear of the mainstream culture and there's, there was this desire to keep themselves and their families separate from that so that they wouldn't be tainted by it and they could keep the, the teaching that they were giving their children pure so they could then bring that into the culture as adults. So because that was kind of what was going on in the 80s, what people were hearing about homeschooling was that kind of approach. And then these kids grew up and they started, you know, many of them, uh, you know, speaking out against homeschooling because of how stifling their experience had been. And so these are the stories that, that people in, in mainstream culture were hearing. And so it kind of 
grew this idea that, you know, homeschooling, it's first of all, it's religious fundamentalists that are, they're all doing it, Christian religious fundamentalists specifically, and that the kids are, you know, they're at the table for all day. They never get to go out. They never get to play with anybody. They're being indoctrinated. You know, it was this very negative view. And because homeschooling has taken quite a while to kind of diversify, there wasn't anybody really speaking out against that. And so that myth has pervaded until now, but however, now we see so many people homeschooling for reasons that have nothing to do with, you know, religion at all. And so it's starting now to change where people are realizing, no, that's, those aren't the only people homeschooling. And that isn't what homeschooling looks like necessarily anymore. There probably are some, you know, families who still kind of take that approach, but on the whole, that's not what homeschooling is about anymore. It's it's much more about giving your child a superior education, a tailored education, you know, and yes, passing on your family's beliefs and values and wanting to make sure that your children are solid in their understanding of those, but not to the detriment of their social development and well-being. So yes, yeah, so that's I think that is why, you know, we kind of see that myth still pervading, but thankfully I think we're starting to see that breakdown. Well, that is certainly good to hear because, you know, I did observe that, uh, you know, you're right. The the motivations back then were, you know, they were leading the charge, the the revolution. So, um, yeah, my my family didn't really fall prey to that reasoning uh, for homeschooling. It was just different. But, um, yeah, it was definitely there. I really liked your your exposition on that. So I've mentioned throughout this conversation that there weren't many myths um, that I had to be like, okay, what does she have to say about this? Because I'm I'm struggling with this one because, you know, we don't homeschool our kids, but we've we've talked a lot about it. Uh And uh, so here was the one that (laughs) stood out to me as I think this one's my biggest one. And it's I'd go crazy being around my kids all day. (laughs) (laughs) So how do you not go crazy being around your two kids all day, Allison? (laughs) Because I'm not around my kids all day. And I think that's one of the things that that it's another one of those parents just don't know because they haven't done it. They haven't really gotten in there and seen it on a daily basis, what it looks like. In our family, um, this is what homeschooling typically looks like. My older daughter, my 13-year-old, very independent. And so I print off her checklist for what she needs to do. She takes it to her room and she goes and does it. So I don't even see her half the time. My younger daughter, I'm still very hands-on with her because of her dyslexia. And just because she likes that connection with me, she wants to be connected and she wants to work with me. She doesn't want to work on her own. So we typically designate the morning as our homeschooling time. And so, you know, while she's eating breakfast, I'll read some history to her. Um, Then we'll sit on the couch and she'll do her math while I'm checking my email. You know, so she's working independently, but I'm not necessarily engaging on every single thing with her. And then once we're done with school, which typically takes, you know, a couple of hours, that's the other thing too. Parents assume, well, you know, my kid in public school, school starts at eight, they get out at three. Oh my gosh, working with my kid for seven hours a day, I couldn't do it. Homeschooling does not take nearly as long as it does to give an education in a public school setting or even a private school setting. The main reason is, first of all, because at least for us here in Texas, I don't have the state breathing down my neck saying I have to spend a certain amount of time every day on things. Um, The second reason is that when you're in a classroom with multiple, typically, you know, 20, 30 kids, hopefully not one of those classes of 40, then you're trying to shepherd all these people through an activity. And you've got kids who aren't listening. And so they ask the question that's already been asked. And then you have to stop and explain it again. And then you have that kid who, you know, can never stop fiddling around with his glue and now it's all over his desk. You need to wait a minute while he cleans it up. And then you've got this kid over here who just won't stop talking. And so you need to reprimand him. And then it's, it's interaction after interruption, after, you know, repeating yourself over and over and over. And so an activity that with one child would take you 10 or 15 minutes could take you 30 or 40 because you're dealing with so many different people. So, when you narrow it down to just that one child, you can work on something as long as you need to, and then you move on. Whereas in a classroom, you don't get to move on until either until everybody's got it or until you say, okay, uh, my lesson plan says we have four more things we need to do by three o'clock. So we're moving on, even though you don't understand, sorry, your parents are going to have to pick this up for you at home, you know? So when you're homeschooling, it's not taking you all day. So we homeschool for a few hours in the morning with breaks and meals and things like that. You know, it comes out to three and a half, maybe four hours, depending on how long our breaks are. 
And then for the rest of the afternoon, everyone kind of goes and does their own thing. So um, maybe that is a co-op or a extracurricular class. My daughter is involved with a game day. Every other Wednesday, we meet at a local comic book store and it's like tabletop games. And so I, I obviously have to bring her to that and I stay, but I get to hang out with my friends, with the other moms there while the kids are all playing. And sometimes the moms will get in and we'll all play a game with the kids. We'll teach them chess or we'll play, you know, Ticket to Ride or um, some fun tabletop game. So it's not like you're sitting there at the table or on the couch with your child for seven straight hours. You can structure it how you want to. And also because, again, homeschooling is growing so much, there are a lot more options for local outsourcing, you might say. So sometimes it's a co-op where you're meeting with other families and you as the parent are actually involved. Um, so maybe, you know, one mom is going to teach uh, science experiments today. And when they're done, then you're going to teach them an art lesson. And when you're done with that, someone else is going to do a story time or something. Or it can be a drop-off class. We have a number of these in our area where you can you could build a whole schedule for a whole day if you wanted for your child. Drop them off at nine. They'd take four or five classes. You'd pick them up in the afternoon. They'd stay there for lunch. And so you, you've got all these various options where if you need that break, if you're that kind of parent who's maybe introverted and you've got extroverted kids and you're like, I cannot handle their energy all day and wanting to talk to me all day, <laughs> you can find ways that you can get them out into an environment where they're going to thrive and be able to, you know, be that person that they are. And then you can get your break. Um, you find parents that you trade off with. You know, we have lots of homeschooling families and we'll say, hey, can, you know, can PJ, my younger one, can she bring her, you know, her math and her history over and finish it with you guys? You know, she wants to come play anyway. They can they can finish their work and then they can play all afternoon. So, you know, you, you just look for you look for what you need. So some parents, they're going to need lots of resources, lots of things that they can do so that some of that burden is taken off of them and, and their kids aren't in the house all day. And yes, there are some parent child, you know, relationships that are just naturally contentious because you both are either way too similar or you're way too different. And so you're just constantly butting heads. And so, yes, you do need to look for ways to make sure that everyone keeps their sanity. But yeah, I, I think parents just assume that homeschooling means you're in your house all day long doing school. And it, it doesn't look like that. We, we often try to get out of the house as much as possible. We'll bring our work to the library. We'll take it to the park. We'll take it to the coffee shop so that we're not in the house all day. And even just being in those public arenas where there's other stuff going on around you, even if you're not necessarily engaged with it, it just kind of gives you that feeling of, you know, you're, you're getting out of your ordinary, you're getting out of your rut and just kind of doing something new and maybe meeting some new people and doing some new things and um, making connections. And that really, when you think about it, that is what true socialization is. It's not being in a classroom with 30 kids that are all your age. Like that's such a false environment. Like when do you ever see that again in your life? You know, it's being out in the world and learning how to interact with lots of different people, how to do that properly, that's socialization. So homeschoolers have way more opportunity to do that because they're not tied to a desk for seven hours. Take your stuff, go to the zoo, go to the museum, go to the park or the nature preserve or the coffee shop or the library or your whatever, your front yard even, just to get out and see the people that you see and talk to people that walk by and, and have that opportunity to interact with the world instead of just interacting with the same people day in, day out, the same books, the same teacher all the time. Yeah. And I'll just add one note. I've also noticed among, you know, with homeschooling kids, they, they have a lot more experience around adults. So they are often, you know, they just seem more respectful and I mean, I know this is probably not always true, but uh, it just seems like they've developed a sense of their interaction with adults, which is often difficult for kids. It is. Yeah. They're, they're not as timid to talk to them and, and to talk to them about just the things that they're interested in, you know, the adult isn't necessarily going to care all that much about your fascination with, you know, dinosaurs or whatever, but there's not this, you know, there's not this idea of, Oh, I need to not talk about the things that other people don't like. Cause it's going to make me look weird. Like that's mm. the socialization kids get in, in public yeah. school, you know, don't be the ham, don't be the nail that sticks up because you're going to get hammered down, fit in with everybody. And that's one of the things that drives me crazy is that adults are constantly telling kids, be unique, be your own person, own, you know, be true to yourself. Um, but then they turn around and they tell homeschoolers that their kids are weird because they don't fit in with everybody. And I was like, why are you just telling these kids here not to worry about fitting in? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and then that's but that's what homeschoolers do. They grow up being themselves and being comfortable being themselves because they're not constantly facing that peer pressure of having to be like everybody else. Yeah. Well, I, I think you've made a good case for homeschooling and you've busted some myths. And so at goodschooling.net, our listeners can visit and read your website. Is there anything else you would like us to know about about your website and what you do for for those who want to homeschool? Sure. Yeah. I, you know, my, my goal obviously is to get as many people homeschooling as want to. Right. And I, I do not try to force everybody into homeschooling. I've talked with people who've wanted me to coach them. And I've said, you know what, I don't know that homeschooling is necessarily the right thing for you. So first of all, if you're listening and you're curious, don't, don't worry about me trying to bludgeon you with the idea of homeschooling and try to force you into it. My goal is to get people homeschooling who really want to and really should be and to help those who are not really cut out for that, figure out maybe a better path for them that maybe does not include homeschooling, but is going to be a better path for their kid. But in order to help as many families as possible, we have like a whole variety of different resources. Our blog is, um, it's very simple. It doesn't have a ton of stuff on it, but everything on there is very specifically crafted to help walk you through that transition. And obviously that's free and there's lots of downloads there. And then we also have a new coaching option as well, where I've actually taken my whole system and I've put it on a self-paced video-based course. And so parents can do that at their own pace. They can do just the course if they want to, along with our Facebook group that you actually get a uh, free membership in that for a while when you, when you purchase the online course. So that's kind of like, you know, a support group mastermind kind of thing with other parents. And I go in there and answer questions and do live streams and things. But then I also offer one-on-one coaching for parents who want it. So, you know, if you're going through the online course and you kind of get stuck on something, you're just not, either you can't find, you know, something that you think you should be able to find certain this exists somewhere, or you're just having trouble figuring out how to work out a certain part of your homeschool, then you can schedule a coaching call. And I help walk you through that, get to know your family, get to know your, what you're looking for and your needs and your personality and your kids' personalities and help you craft the homeschooling experience that you want for your family. And that's really the main focus for me is not trying to impose a particular philosophy on people and say, everybody should homeschool this way, but instead helping families figure out what is the best approach to homeschooling for them. Well, Allison, thank you for joining us on our podcast to talk about uh, a really important topic, uh, one that I have kind of always been interested in, and I know many of our listeners will as well. Thank you so much for letting me on, Doug. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. So Allison, I snuck in a phrase near the end, and I hope people stay afterward. I didn't I didn't say why they, they should or anything like that, but I said you've made the case for homeschooling. And I kind of choose those words on purpose mm-hmm. uh, because there's kind of a personal biography note that I didn't want to bring up during an episode, but it's kind of cool that, that I made this connection through digging in about you on your website and your Amazon bio, and that is your maiden name and who your father is, and that is he is Lee Strobel, who is the author of a Case for Christ, Case for Faith, Case for a Creator, and maybe a few others. I can't. I've only read two of them. So uh, anyway, that's that's really cool. So um, you said that you'd be willing to talk a little bit uh, for just a few minutes about what it was like. And uh, for people who don't know the story, maybe you can give them the one paragraph version. Yeah. So my dad was uh, an atheist for most of his adult life up until uh, 1980 when he completed a two-year investigation into Christianity in an attempt to dismantle it because my mom had gone and made herself a Christian. And he was devastated at this. He thought she'd been sucked into a cult. 
he was actually planning if she did not leave Christianity, he, he was planning to divorce her. He was not going to stay with her. And so this was kind of his last ditch effort to save their marriage was to show her how wrong Christianity was. And so he did this two year investigation into the resurrection to try to discredit it. And at the end of those two years, he realized that um, there was more evidence for the resurrection than there was against it. And as he always puts it, it would have taken more faith to remain an atheist than it would have to become a Christian after all he had learned. And so he became a Christian in 1980. And then in the late 90s, he wrote a book about that experience called Case for Christ. And everything kind of exploded from there. <laughs> so I, I find that interesting. This is kind of an example of, you know, I, I know that a lot of like really, really conservative Christians might think that if you're an atheist, you have no moral grounding or, you know, that you're just a relativist or whatever. But I mean, what I heard from you is that your dad wanted to save his marriage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. By disproving Christianity. <laughs> yeah. He wanted my mom to become the person that he had married. He, you know, he felt like she was like, he'd kind of been um, blindsided and kind of a bait and switch. And he, he loved her. They'd been together. They met when they were 13. And so they had spent, you know, their teen years together, their early twenties together. They got married young and they'd, they'd been married for a long time already at that point. And you know, he, he loved her. He wanted to stay with her, but he did not want to, you know, he, he was assuming that as a Christian, she would constantly be breathing down his neck about all of this God stuff. And obviously, you know, he, he didn't want that. He wanted the woman he had married and he, he wanted to save their marriage and to get their marriage back to what it had been. And so, yeah, that's, that was, that was what he was trying to do. He, he wanted to save her from this terrible mistake that she'd made. <laughs> Was the experience, I mean, obviously it took him, what, you said about two years to mm -hmm. to do the investigation. I mean, it wasn't, I, I'm surely they talked about this along the way and it wasn't, a, a, I don't think it was a f switch that flipped, was it? Or was it like gradually he did all of this intellectual research, but also watched probably the change in your mom? Mm -hmm. What was that, what was that like observing for you? Well, I was at the time, let's see. So he became a Christian when I was about two. So, or I'm sorry, my mom did. My mom became a Christian when I was about two. So I was still very young. However, the change that I saw really came after my dad became a Christian. He he had anger issues. He was um, he was often drunk. He was a workaholic. Um, so even as a small child, I was already afraid of him. I, I didn't really want him in the house. I would leave from my room when he would come home because I didn't want to be out where he was. And my parents were fighting. I mean, there was it, it wasn't you know this thing that he was doing quietly. You're right. I mean, he he made it very clear to her. I'm, I'm going to prove all this wrong. You're wrong about this this God stuff, and I'm going to prove it. And my mom, um, you know, God bless her. She just tried to be as patient and as kind and as open as she could be. She, you know, she'd do her quiet time in the morning, but as soon as he got up, she'd put it all away. You know, she wouldn't sit there with her Bible in front of her. Like, you know, I dare you to, to ask me about this. You know, she, um, you know, she very rarely invited him to church. She would take me but she wouldn't necessarily invite him every great once in a while she would. And uh, one time he actually came, but he brought his reporter's notebook so that if anyone he knew saw him, he could say he was just doing a story on the church. He didn't want anyone to think he was going <laughs> because he actually wanted to. And, um, and so, you know, she, she just tried to be a witness and just prayed like crazy. And other people were praying like crazy for him. And he kept doing this search and he was talking to a lot of museums about, you know, different artifacts and things and reading tons of books. And there was one day in November of 1980, I think it was November 8th, that he finally sat down kind of with everything. This was kind of, you know, he'd, he'd looked through all of the various books and read, you know, all the stuff he wanted to read. And he was going through his notes and trying to basically do kind of a kind of a pro con list in a way, like what, what things support, what things are against. And the support list just kept growing and kept growing and kept growing, and kept growing. And he, re and that was, that was the day that he realized, oh my gosh, there is so much evidence for the resurrection. There's so much evidence for what Christians actually believe. And that was the day when he realized I need to either believe this and follow the, the path of this, uh, of all this evidence, or I need to keep my atheism knowing that I don't really have a logical reason to do so. And so there was kind of a, a flip of a switch in terms of one specific day when it really, it all culminated and it all finally clicked. And that was the day that he became a Christian. 
I could imagine his, you know, he made this comment that he didn't have enough faith to continue being an atheist because that would have required him to wait decades, if not till he dies, for better answers, more satisfactory to fill up that cons list. Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so you would have been, let's see, you said the book was written in the mid to late 90s, right? The mm-hmm. Case for Christ, the first one? Yeah. And so you you would have been able to watch this as not a two-year-old, well, um, yeah. as a little bit older. Uh, so how did that affect you and your family? Um, when Case for Christ came out, you mean? Yeah, because it was very successful. I remember personally reading it as a teenager and thinking – as I kind of reflect on this now, I think, oh, that was sort of the apologetics grounding that I needed. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I never doubted my faith, really. Yeah. Um, but that really kind of bolstered some foundations about, OK, the resurrection happened. There's kind of silly if you don't believe that, yeah. you know, and so that I, I could continue moving on any of those intellectual things. But, you know, I re- so it, I know it was very popular, but mm-hmm. I never thought I'd be talking to a family member, you know, so many <laughs> yeah. years later. So I want to kind of know a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it was it was crazy. It took off out of nowhere. And, you know, I was kind of used to living in a fishbowl anyway, because, you know, my dad was one of the pastors at Willow Creek, which was the largest church in the country at the time. And so I was used to people knowing who I was, but not me knowing who they were and that and that sort of thing. But it it really just exponentially took off from there. And then, you know, it was like whenever people would hear my last name, they'd go crazy. Oh, my gosh, Lee Strobel. Are you related to Lee Strobel? Oh, that book, that book. And everyone just was so excited to have, you know, it wasn't like this information was new. Like all this information was out there. And the, the revolutionary thing that he did was make it readable, like write it as a narrative, as a story, not just kind of a reference book, you know, and that made it so much more accessible. And so I think that was kind of the magic of it that made it so popular was that this was something anybody could read. Like you said, high schoolers, you know, high schoolers, college students could read this. You didn't have to have, you know, it it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I've got a research paper to write. I'm going to go look up all these facts. It was an actual story, which made it so much more compelling and so much more interesting. And, and so I think that was what, what really caused that explosion and really set the stage for kind of all of these books that followed and, and taking that same approach, just making this information so much more accessible for people who don't necessarily have that kind of apologetics brain that's mm-hmm. going to really, you know, first of all, want to go out and find this information, but also know where to find it and how to put it all together. Yeah. Were you proud of him? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, it was so cool. It was funny because my junior year of college, I studied abroad in Scotland and my parents came to visit me in November and my dad had just gotten rewrites. He was working on the book at the time. And, um, my mom was like, Oh, he just got all these notes from the editor. They've got this great new idea for how they're going to approach it. They're going to do it like a story. That wasn't the original kind of idea. And so my dad was like frantically rewriting chapters while they were visiting. And so we would pretty much, my mom and I would go see the sites in Scotland and then we would come back for dinner and meet with my dad. (laughs) So I didn't get to see him much on the trip, which was kind of a bummer, but it's kind of funny to think back to, oh yeah, I remember when that happened, like when that switch happened, when they came up with that idea and and knowing that that was like, that was the key to making the book as popular as it was kind of funny. Yeah, that's really cool. So maybe maybe you can write the case for homeschooling and publish it, and <laughs> hopefully it will start the homeschool the the second wave of homeschooling revolution. <laughs> well, there you go. You got my next project for me. Thank you, Doug. All right, there we go. Thanks, Allison. Yep. Thank you, Doug. <laughs>